Well, good afternoon. Um, let me start uh, just by uh, thanking Mike Rappaport, Mike Ramsey, and Steve Smith, and of course the Hugh and Hazel Darling Foundation and the USD Originalism Center. Um, you really have, uh, you really are the envy of many law schools, or at least uh, from my perspective. Uh, what a well-run conference! I really like the format. I also want to thank Larry Solom for uh, reading my paper and uh, all the other participants here. Uh, before talking about uh, my paper on uh, dictionaries from the founding era, I want to just say a few words about the context. I've been working for a number of years on a series of guides to the original meaning uh, of the Constitution, to sources of the original meaning of the Constitution. I've written a short guide on the Federalist Papers and one on the uh, records of the Federal Constitutional Convention of 1787 and another one on the uh, records of the state ratifying convention. Um, I find that there's sort of a lack of, of clear guidance on what these sources are, uh, the theories for citing them, and most importantly, the potential pitfalls uh, in using them. Uh, I, I really don't have any axe to grind in preparing these guides. I'm not trying to uh, sway debate or anything other than to just try to improve the quality of the citation. My goal is to be helpful to lawyers and judges and law clerks, and particularly, I like to think that I'm aiming uh, these guides at a typical, very intelligent, um, but perhaps not perfectly prepared uh, law clerk, somebody at that, uh, that level. I know when I was a law clerk, I was very worried about citing uh, or trying to evaluate a citation that referred to the Federalist Papers or the notes for the Constitutional Convention. I didn't know what happened at those, uh, at the Constitutional Convention. I didn't quite get it in, in any class I took in law school. and so. That's what the, these guides are, are useful for. And I do know that uh, clerks at the Supreme Court have these guides. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is reading them, but I have heard from a couple people about them. Uh, moving on to uh, dictionaries, uh, it's now standard practice in big constitutional law cases to cite dictionaries from the 1700s. Um, we saw it in uh, NFIB v. Sebelius, we saw it in Lopez, we saw it in any number of, of recent cases, the, uh, the gun control cases. Uh, pretty much every big case now contains uh, citations of dictionaries from the founding era. And I think this is going to become more common uh, with the availability of all these historic dictionaries on the internet. Um, they're all now available for free on Google Books. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think it's difficult to see why anyone would not want to know what the dictionary definition of the words in the Constitution were. Uh, if you're not looking up the word, uh, you're sort of just deciding on the meaning of your own linguistic background, your own intuition of what it means. Um, it would seem like having the additional information would not be help, uh, would be, uh, having the additional information would be helpful under any theory. And yet the use of these dictionaries is controversial. Indeed, uh, it's often subject to ridicule. When people talk about Justice Scalia, who are not originalists, they often first point to his citation of dictionaries as just something that's uh, very, very strange. I think the problem seems to be that the theories and assumptions uh, behind the use of dictionaries is not uh, uh, well, not completely stated. Usually the dictionary is simply cited. Uh, maybe one dictionary is cited or two dictionaries cited. Nothing uh, explained about the dictionaries. Uh, the objections are usually not clearly articulated either, uh, and certainly not the responses uh, to these objections. Um, what I've written here is sort of a first draft of a first effort at this. There, I didn't find anything that was quite on point when I started the article. and. Um, so I've just tried to put together my own thoughts. I sort of had three objectives. Uh, the first was to talk a little bit about the theory of citing dictionaries. Everybody sort of recognizes that they can provide evidence of the original objective meaning of the Constitution. That's perhaps with the uh, growth of objective meaning or public meaning, uh, jurisprudence uh, and originalism. Uh, that may be one reason that more people are citing the dictionaries. I think you could also use them uh, if you were interested in the original intent of the framers, original understanding of the ratifiers, if you are looking up words that they use to describe the Constitution. For example, if you look up words in the Federalist Papers, that might be uh, a reason that you'd be trying to figure out what Hamilton thought uh, rather than necessarily what the objective meaning of the Constitution was. Uh, the second objection is to uh, identify, articulate, and, ex and ass ex uh, assess six possible grounds for impeaching claims about the original meaning that rely on dictionaries from the founding era. That is to say, people are making claims about what the original meaning is and citing dictionaries as evidence. And I listed six different categories. I made these categories up just based on the kinds of criticisms that I saw. Nobody else had really put them in these categories. Maybe I, I haven't defined the categories as well as I might. 
what I refer to insufficiency, that is to say, a criticism that merely having a definition of a word does not uh, determine the answer to a constitutional question, incompleteness, the problem that uh, no dictionary contains every definition or possible definition of a word, inapplicability, the idea that some uh, terms, some possible definitions that are listed in, in a dictionary are not necessarily applicable in a, in a particular context in the Constitution, inconsistency, the idea that there's no sort of standard as when you look as to when you look up words and which uh, dictionaries you look at, uh, imprecision, the problem that uh, the words, the definitions and dictionaries are often very short, don't contain a lot of content, and then also the problem of incorrectness, that there might be obsolete or other incorrect terms in the dictionary. I think there's something to all these uh, different grounds, and I've tried to provide examples. Uh, my own view is that three of them are perhaps <clears throat> the most important. Uh, the incompleteness problem, which is you never really know that the author of the dictionary, or the compiler of the dictionary, included all the definitions. And so if you look at a word like regulate and a word like commerce, and you say, well, the asserted meaning by one of the parties is not listed in the dictionary, you don't really know that the dictionary contains all the definitions. Uh, imprecision. Uh, well, they weren't necessarily defining the words for the purpose of resolving all of the issues that might be there. Again, a word like regulate, they may have given the most common meanings, but they didn't really define it so carefully that it could be used to uh, decide every particular issue. And then I think inconsistency. I don't think the court has been very good in its practice of looking at all the available dictionaries and considering all the possible meanings. Uh, most charitably, they have been looking at the dictionary that's on their desk and uh, looking at it that way. Less charitably, they've been looking through all the dictionaries and just citing the ones that are, are favorable. Um, in going through these problems, I suggest that all of them are manageable. Mostly they're manageable just so, by simply looking at additional sources. Uh, and I think almost all the judges have been doing that, although I think they might do a better job. My third objective in the paper uh, is to provide uh, URLs for the dictionaries so that you can all find them. Uh, on the internet. In fact, if you forget everything else I've written, at least I've given you a good distraction uh, to go and uh, look up some of these dictionaries. Uh, the links are all right there. You can spend a lot of time. I didn't know in Samuel Johnson's dictionary that the word starting with V came before the word starting with U. Uh, just <clears throat> did the alphabet differently uh, then. Um, I want to say a little bit more about the uh, uh, the different dictionaries. Uh, I don't. I didn't get that part finished in the, in the draft of the paper. I apologize for that. But I will be saying a little bit more describing the major dictionaries uh, that have been used, at least that I know have been used by the Supreme Court. What I need help with is that, well, I just, I've got about five or six things right here. I'm not really clear on how this fits in with the original methods, originalism. Uh, I don't really know as much about the science of uh, lexicography in the 1700s as I should know. Uh, most specifically, I don't know much about the reputations of the various dictionaries. I could find no hierarchy of dictionaries beyond the fact that most, uh, that uh, Samuel Johnson's dictionary is the most commonly cited, but no explanation for why that is so and, and what might be wrong with other dictionaries. Um, I'd like to know if there are other objections to using dictionaries that I haven't addressed, uh, other helpful examples that you might think of that I might include in my paper. Um, and. Uh, <clears throat> Also, I guess the final question is, uh, am I overly optimistic in thinking that this is a reliable source and that if you just look at a few other sources and try to make sense of it in a reasonable way that this actually does contribute uh, to something? So those are the questions that I think would be very helpful to uh, if you could uh, provide me some guidance on those. Thank you.